to today's I see a technology showcase webinar. Uh, it's brought to us by Price Disney, who's a gold sponsor at our conference next month in Portland. Um, today we have Chris Price talking about the top five uses of true planning. Um, so he'll be going for about 45, 45, 50 minutes, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, anyone who has a question, please use the questions text box on your GoToWebinar little panel thing there. Uh, and then we'll get to uh, everybody's questions in order as we as we get to the end. So I'm going to turn it over to Chris. Chris, are you there? Okay. Yes. Can you hear me? I sure can. And um, if Great. anyone has side questions, you can also use the chat box that will go to me. Um, but otherwise, I think you're ready to go. Okay, Megan. Thank you very much. Uh, well, as Megan says, I'm Chris Price with Price Systems Professional Services, and I'm pleased to uh, be with you all today for about an hour to present the top five uses of true planning. Uh, one, uh, in a series of ICEA Technology Showcase webinars. So uh, stay tuned for additional webinars as well. So let me begin. Uh, the agenda is as follows. I'm going to start with a brief introduction, and then I'm going to introduce how uh, predictive cost analytics uh, aligns with the DOD 5000 acquisition process. And then we'll dig a little deeper and look at how true planning can support different business process areas, those main process areas being business development, manufacturing, early stage conceptual estimation, finance, program or project management, and engineering. And then finally, we'll dive deeper and I'll actually demonstrate to you the top five use cases for true planning. So with that said, uh, a brief introduction. Uh, predictive cost analytics can be used for a wide variety of uses. So through discussions with our many customers, uh, we've learned a few things. Uh, we've learned that most specific users use true planning for uh, a small number of different applications, uh, one or two typically. Uh, but in interviewing our broad base of customers, we've learned that there are many, many different applications for true planning. And that's what I'd really like to talk to you about today. So in this webinar, we'll briefly talk about many of these use cases and demonstrate the top five. So let me begin by showing a map of how uh, predictive or price cost analytics can support the DOD 5000 acquisition process. As you can see, that's shown across the top. Uh, and underneath are various different applications for price cost analytics. Uh, as you might expect, uh, there's a predominance of different types of applications early in a system life cycle. Uh, particularly during analysis of alternatives and concept exploration, uh, even technology development. Uh, but what many people don't realize is that there are also many uses at towards the end uh, of a life cycle, all the way out into operations and support. Um, certainly life cycle cost estimates um, and engineering change proposals. And I'm going to highlight some of these in the webinar today. So let me go just a little bit deeper and talk about each of these business process areas that uh, price cost analytics supports. Um, um, I, I want to say before I get into these that uh, although we were the scribe to create these slides, it's really our customers who gave us the information for these slides. It's our customers that have told us that they use true planning for all these different things that you see here. So this first slide focuses on business development. Uh, true planning uh, and price cost analytics has a key role in supporting business development. And you can see a list uh, of the typical things that true planning can support. I'll note that the highlighted ones are the actual use cases that I'm going to demonstrate to you today. Next is manufacturing and early stage conceptual estimation. 
Uh, for manufacturing, we support design to cost as well as design trade-off analysis as, and trade studies. For early stage conceptual estimation, production time phases, producibility studies, as well as large structure estimation. Uh, next is finance. Uh, as you would expect, any cost estimation tool uh, closely supports finance objectives. Um, specifically, price cost analytics uh, actually expands that boundary and allows finance to do some things that they typically are not able to do with conventional pricing tools, one of which is supplier assessment, and we'll show a demonstration of that today. Next is program or project management. Uh, you can briefly see the list of different things that we support in that discipline, uh, including trade studies and unit production cost assessments, which I'll demonstrate for you today. And last is engineering. So I'm guessing that many of you are engineers and you can appreciate the uh, benefit that cost analytics has in the engineering realm. There's a long list of different potential applications, uh, a couple of which I've already mentioned. Um, and I'm going to focus today on the use of true planning to support engineering change proposals. All right, with, so with that brief introduction, I'd like to dive right into the five top use cases. Let me first introduce what we're going to do for these use cases. Um, for, the, for the top five use, uses in true planning, I'm going to use um, a true planning test case for the Striker interim armored vehicle. Um, and the background for these trade studies is that the U.S. Army has a desire to perform some upgrades on the existing Stryker IAV. Uh, we'll use the Stryker IAV test case in true planning to estimate the cost of these upgrades. So for those of you who are not familiar with the latest version of true planning, let me introduce to you what I mean by test cases. Um, I'm going to open up true planning now for you. True Planning 16. And when you first open uh, True Planner uh, 2016, uh, you'll notice this view. And for those of you who have not used True Planning, or for those of you who have used versions of True Planning prior to 2016, you'll notice a marked change in 2016. Uh, when True Planner first opens, you'll see on the left your list of most recent files. Uh, but more importantly, you'll see a number of templates and test cases that are available to you uh, to get a quick, easy start to your cost estimate. Now, we have a variety uh, of different templates and test cases, and I want to demonstrate that to you. If I click on the spyglass in the upper right, True Planner will actually go out to the price website real time and pull back all of the currently published templates and test cases available to you. Um, and you can see it came back and showed here on the right that there's a total of, I have a total of 212 possible templates and test cases available to me. And you can see the categorization of those uh, by platform type. If I click on one of these as an example, um, like surface vehicles, you'll see that we have 23 different uh, test cases and templates here for different types of surface vehicles. Um, let me briefly explain to you the difference between a template and a test case. So basically what we do is we create, we first create generalized templates per a WBS. And most of the templates that are out there today are based on MIL standard 881C. So, for example, right here uh, in the center of the screen, you'll see a template for a surface vehicle based on MIL standard 881C. Then what we do is we apply that template to specific platforms, or in this case, vehicles. So each of these other things that say test case, as you can see, are the application of that basic MIL standard 881C template to specific vehicles. So let me click on the striker vehicle as an example and hit create. 
and this will go ahead and pull down that template from the price website and automatically launch it in True Planning. Now while that's doing that, let me tell you how we develop these test cases. It's important for you to know that these test cases are built on publicly available information. We do not share our customers' proprietary information for these templates. Rather, we use public information. And you can see exactly what public information we use by clicking on the properties uh, at the top level. Um, excuse me, uh, notes, I meant, at the top level. <clears throat> Uh, and then we'll actually attach the references that we've used to create the test case. So for in this, in this particular case, this varies, but in this particular case, you can see our reference was Wikipedia. And I can actually open that attachment from here, uh, which is a copy of the Stryker web page in, in uh, Wikipedia. And you can see the actual data uh, that we use to create this test case. All right, so moving forward. With that said, uh, let me close out of this generic version of True Planning and open up a version that I've modified. So I've taken the Stryker IAV template you see here and modified to demonstrate the top five use cases of True Planning. So let me open that up and introduce the first use case to you. So the first use case we'd like to demonstrate today is a bid, no bid case. And here's the background for this use case. The Army has found that the existing hatches on the Stryker vehicle do not allow for easy enough egress with full gear and has asked us to look at increasing the size of the hatch. Um, a new hull must yield a unit production cost equal to or less than the existing unit production cost of the hull of $341,145. So in true planning, we will estimate the increase in the hatch size uh, and conversely make the opening in the hull larger to accommodate the larger hatch. Let me show you how we do that. So here is that same uh, Stryker uh, IAV model. Uh, in 881C, and this first trade is a hull frame body cab trade, so let me open up that subsystem, uh, and you can see where I've included the trade here. And the way I do these trades is these first few cops, cost objects that you see that say hatch assembly baseline, hull assembly baseline, crew compartment baseline, are the baseline existing cost objects for the baseline template, unmodified. What I do is I generally build a new model or take copies of these and modify them to estimate the modification of interest. So before I show you those, let me first show you that um, if I click on the subsystem WBS, uh, that you can see, so right now I've included the baseline costs and excluded the modifications based on this exclude option. So you can see that the baseline unit production cost for the whole frame body cab right here is $341,145, which is our baseline bogey for the modification. So now I start beginning the modification, and I'll include these new modified cost objects here now. And I can briefly show you how we estimated these mods. We did a simple estimate where we took the existing items and we modified those. So here was the original hatch assembly uh, with a weight of 440 kilograms. Um, and by estimating the increase in weight due to an increased size, uh, we've esti esti estimated that the size of that hatch will grow to 470, actually 471 kilograms. Now since we increase the hatch size, uh, we're actually opening up the hull to support the larger hatch, 
So the whole baseline mass was 2,164 kilograms, and we estimate that it's going to reduce slightly to 1,850 kilograms when we incorporate the larger hatch. Now lastly, uh, in order to accommodate an easier egress from the crew, we we're also making a few minor changes to the crew compartment assembly, uh, and that resulted in a change in mass as well. So that resulted in a change in mass from 119.7 kilograms down to 107.7 or 108 kilograms. Okay, so with that said, if I exclude now the baseline, and only look at the cost of the upgrade, which I'll do the same way I looked at the baseline cost. I'll go back here to the whole frame body cab, and I'll go look at the metrics. And you can see that the new uh, unit production cost for the hull, uh, for, the, for the modified hull, is $340,379. Which is lower than the 341,145 baseline. Uh, so basically, we can bid this modification since we're less than the baseline. So that concludes use case one. Uh, let me move to use case two. Use case two is a bid validation. In this case, the Army's provided an RFP for an upgrade to the fire control subsystem on the striker vehicle uh, to go from conventional controls and displays to heads-up displays. As an independent cost estimator for the contractor performing the bid, you've been asked to perform a should cost estimate to validate the bottoms-up bid. Uh, we also note that in addition to the control and display subsystem, it's been determined that the fire control processor also needs to be upgraded to support the new heads-up display functionality. So allow me to demonstrate to you how we perform this estimate in true planning. Uh, I'll close up the hull modification and go to the fire control subsystem where I have built a bid validation use case. So similarly here, uh, you can see that there was a baseline cost for controls and displays and the fire control processor. Um, I've estimated the cost for the new heads-up display uh, as well as an upgrade to the fire control processor. Now, the Army has asked us to report uh, our estimate to them in the mill standard 881C uh, format. So uh, for this particular use case, I'm actually going to use our true mapper capability uh, to show that comparison in 881C format. So um, what I want to do is I want to open up True Mapper by going to Tools, Manage Mapping, Mappings, clicking on 881C and Edit and View That, will, which will launch the Mapper capability. Uh, I'll bring it over here for you. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the Mapper capability, let me just briefly introduce you to this without getting into details. Um, if you look at this screen, one thing you should notice is that in the upper center of the screen here, uh, we effectively have the Stryker IAV product breakdown structure that we've already been looking at in true planning. What we've done in Mapper is we've now imported the mill standard 881C WBS for surface vehicles over here on the right. And what this tool does for us is it allows us to map the resulting costs from true planning to the mill standard 881C format. And simply stated, the tool at the bottom allows us to show what we've mapped where um, and to verify that everything is mapped correctly. So when these turn green and you see 100%, that's an indicator to you that you've correctly mapped 
all of these individual activities correctly to MIL standard 881C. So I don't want to spend a lot of time with that today, but really what I want to do is focus on this tab called WBS totals, uh, which provides uh, the entire estimated cost, not only for the fire control subsystem upgrade, but for the new cost for the entire Stryker IAV vehicle. And in, a, in order to report the cost delta uh, between the upgrade and the existing baseline cost, uh, what I've done is I've captured uh, in Excel uh, the original baseline cost, um, which I can show you, maybe. Here it is. So all I've done is capy, capture the baseline cost in Excel, and then I can take this baseline cost for the baseline vehicle, and I can copy it uh, over to the mapping utility, paste. And basically what you can see here uh, is that you can now see the cost delta uh, for our fire control subsystem. And you'll also notice as you look at this, there's a little anomaly here on the suspension and steering. I think I probably have a trade in there identified. Uh, but other than that, uh, you can see that there's no impact to any of the other subsystems. There's no delta cost. Uh, except for the fire control system, um, and as you might expect, some minor impact to the overall vehicle assembly, integration, and test, uh, and then also at the top level to reflect some additional, uh, slight amount of additional uh, program management costs, uh, as well as a little bit of uh, additional data costs, system engineering program management, uh, and data costs down here at the bottom. So from here, we can clearly see that the cost of the fire control upgrade is $3,450,317. Try that again. $3,450,317. And we can also see that the total cost of the upgrade to the government is $4,075,705. So we can provide this report to our U.S. government customer to show them in MIL standard 881C format what the cost impact of this upgrade is. Okay, so I'm going to exit out of this, close this, and go to the next use case. Introduce that to you. Uh, use case number three is an engineering change proposal. So in this case, the Army has asked us to estimate the cost of an ECP to improve the functionality of the current command and control software on the Stryker vehicle. Uh, they're adding requirements for updates for both the command interface as well as the control interface. So we can use the true planning fast function point calculator to estimate the increase in function points for these two new requirements and hence uh, the increase uh, in development, software development cost. So let me show you how we do that in true planning. Let's close this one. Go down to the primary vehicle software release WBS in 881C where you can see I have built a use case for the software ECP. Um, let me basically unhide the baseline case so that we can look at both of them together. All right, and I'll go to the input sheet. So here first is the command and control CSCI baseline estimate. Um, and you can see here that that was based on a total of 366 IFPUG function points. Now, one thing I want to point out to you, by the way, is that some of you may not use or be familiar with function points, um, but I just want to make clear that you do not have to estimate software based on function points in true planning. 
we actually have a number of different calculators, types of calculators to use to estimate software size. Um, there are several different types of function point calculators, um, but we also certainly have uh, a SLOC calculator, which is probably more commonly used. And we also have a higher le level functional size calculator um, that's very, uh, very useful during early requirements phases as well as a use case conversion point calculator for those folks that do object oriented design and development. So multiple different ways to estimate size. I'm just using the fast function point calculator as an example here. And so when I go to my command and control CSCI update, I've used, you'll see I've used the fast function point calculator to estimate the increased size of the software. Um, I start with the original requirements for the CNC CSCI, and you can see those shown here on the first row. And then I've added the additional requirements for the command interface update, as well as the control software update. So you can see an additional seven function points here for the command interface, and another four function points for the software control interface resulting in a new total function point count of 425. So when I click on that, that enters the 425 into the baseline estimate for um, the new software upgrade. So I can easily compare the results uh, by using a um, true planning chart. So let me go to the charts and pull up the ECP use case and click on the use case here. So here you can clearly see the, this, the, the, the growth uh, in development cost as a result of the additional requirements. We went from a total development cost for the previous software of 7,995,000 or 996,000 to a total now of uh, 9,331,489, representing an increase of 1,335,567. Now another thing we can do easily with true planning is we can see what has impacted this increase in cost by actually looking at the activities that make that up. So I can click on this chart and now you'll see that same cost summary broken down by activities. Um, and you can see that it's uh, primarily the software design and the code and unit tests uh, with slight increases in the other areas as well um, that cause the increase in software development costs. All right, so that completes this use case. Let me uh, turn this back off and to go back to PowerPoint to introduce the next one to you. Use case four is an engineering trade study. In this case, the striker vehicle must be able to be airlifted, and the maximum weight lift, weight limit for airlift is no more than 15,000 kilograms. The vehicle's currently overweight by about 300 kilograms at 15,299 kilograms. The Army has asked us to investigate possible weight savings ideas that do not compromise the performance of the vehicle in any way. So looking at this, we believe that if we can substitute titanium axles for the existing steel axles, that we might be able to meet the vehicle weight budget with a relatively negligible increase in unit production costs. So let me show you that trade in true planning. Let's close up this last one. Uh, let's see, axles are part of the suspension steering system, subsystem, uh, where you see I've built a little axle trade study here. Let me go back to this. Um, and let me undo the, well, first of all, let me show you, in fact. Uh, so right now I have the baseline uh, cost in here for the existing steel axles. axles. 
And I want to go up here and show you the weight of the vehicle in the metrics. We go to metrics. Uh, and sure enough, you can see that the, uh, the current weight of the vehicle is uh, uh, over budget uh, at 15,299 kilograms against a requirement of 15,000 kilograms for airlift. So what we want to do is uh, go do this trade um, to use titanium axles and see if that helps us with meet that budget. So let me turn on the titanium axles. And let me show you briefly how I did this trade. Um, so here's the baseline steel axles and the inputs for them. You can see that the individual steel axles weigh 143 kilograms a piece, uh, and we've estimated a manufacturing complexity for structure for those steel axles using what we call the conceptual uh, calculator in true planning, MCPLXS, conceptual calculator. And we've estimated the complexity of the steel structures based on the fact that they're machined, uh, they're machined parts in an assembly, uh, their weight range is over 200 kilograms, uh, and they're made up of steel alloys. So true planning calculates a manufactured complexity for structure for us of 4.388 for that type of part, which when we click OK gets populated on the input screen for the steel axles. So we want to do a similar model for titanium axles. Now we've used the mass properties of titanium to determine that a titanium axle of the exact same shape and size will weigh less. And we've estimated that the axle for, for this vehicle uh, would be 82 kilograms. Now we have to recognize that titanium is harder to machine than steel. And so we use our manufacturing complexity for structure calculator again to estimate the manufacturing complexity for the titanium axles. Again, we're using the conceptual calculator, uh, machine parts, machine parts and assembly, uh, generally over 200, uh, actually to between 20 and 200 kilograms now uh, with the lower weight. Um, and most importantly, we're recognizing that we're using titanium, which as I mentioned before, is harder to machine uh, than steel. So we actually get a resulting increase in manufacturing complexity of 4.798. When we click on OK, that populates in the input to true planning for the titanium axles. So now when I calculate this model, um, first of all, I can easily see the delta in weight of the two axles by going to a chart uh, and clicking on an appropriate chart, which I have pre-saved. So here you can easily see the, the, the weight savings that you get per axle uh, by going to titanium. We went from 143 kilograms down to uh, 82 kilograms. Uh, now, the real acid test is we really want to see what that's done at the vehicle level. So to do that, I'll turn the steel axles off and only look at the upgrade case, and we'll go back to the system level, and we'll look at the metrics to see what the resulting weight of the vehicle is. Uh, lo and behold, our total weight for the vehicle has gone down to 14,944 kilograms, which of course is under the 15,000 kilogram uh, airlift weight limit. So our titanium trade has successfully allowed us to meet the airlift requirement. Uh, I should mention that um, uh, nothing's free, and so the titanium, the cost of titanium axles did cause an increase uh, in the unit production cost, which I won't bother to show you, but I have written down here that the Increase in the unit production cost is a total of $1,809, which is only 0.05% uh, at the vehicle level, uh, pretty much negligible.
but a slight cost increase. Okay, so um, that pretty much concludes use case four. Uh, let me move to use case five, the last use case. This one's a little more complex. So use case five uh, deals with supplier assessments. And there's actually two different uh, subset of use cases that I'm going to show you here. The first one is a make versus buy. Um, so to introduce this use case, uh, we're going to assume that the U.S. Army has a desire to perform a major vehicle upgrade on the existing Stryker IAV. Um, the current vehicle has eight wheels with four axles, but the Army has found that it is somewhat unstable in certain circumstances and has done an analysis to determine that the vehicle needs to have at least two more wheels to improve the stability. However, the Army needs to ensure that the new vehicle is still agile and can travel at ground speeds greater than 50 miles an hour. Uh, also, the vehicle must be able to accommodate uh, a helicopter airlift, as we already discussed previously. We know that that max weight for the vehicle is 15,000 kilograms. Uh, Army's done an allocation uh, to the engine to determine that the engine can be no more than 3,000 pounds. The overall unit production cost for the new vehicle is $3.4 million in as spent or then year dollars. Uh, and when allocated to the engine, the engine must be less than $3,000. The minimum range requirement for the vehicle is 350 miles and the engine must produce at least 200 horsepower. So in order to do this trade, we can leverage an engine database that we have to estimate both the cost of a new engine, the make case, uh, as well as search for existing COTS engines that might meet these requirements. So let me show you that. I'll start with the engine database in Excel. So here's our existing engine database in Excel. Uh, as you see, it consists of uh, about 15 different engines, along with associated data for those. I'll just kind of scan over this. You can see uh, production dates, quantities manufactured, um, drive types, whether it's supported, wheeled, or tracked vehicles, number of drive wheels, the horsepower of the engines, uh, the road speed that they supported, um, the range that was achieved with these engines, uh, and then some other statistics like the weight, uh, the actual uh, normalized unit costs, uh, production dates, and uh, we've also included our calculated manufacturing complexity values for each of, for the models for each of these engines. So what I want to demonstrate is how we can use this existing engine database uh, both to find COTS engines that meet our requirements uh, as well as identify the input parameters that we need to design a new engine to meet the requirements. And how do I do that? I, I do that uh, with what we call the true findings capability. So let me pull up true findings for you. So this is true findings. Just like with the mapper tool, I'll give you a very brief introduction to it for those who have not used it before. Um, in this upper center pane, uh, you'll, you should recognize that this is the exact same engine database that I just showed you in Excel. And we've done a simple import of that data into the true findings capability. So you can see the same data here. Um, in the columns that we had in the uh, engine database in Excel. So how can we leverage true findings uh, to derive the information we need? Um, what we do is we create what are called findings, and I've actually done that down here. But let me show you how I did that. So let's talk about the new engine first. How can I use this data to estimate a new engine? So what we want to do is we want to try to estimate what the weight and manufacturing complexity would be for a new engine uh, based on this historical data that we have here. 
So if I click on engine weight, it's going to show me an analysis that I've already completed to save time today, where I've effectively generated a, a new CER for engine weight as a function of horsepower, number of drive wheels, range, and road speed. You can see that resulting multivariate CER over here in the center bottom pane. Uh, along with inputs for the various independent variables uh, and the resulting engine weight. So I actually go in here and I, I input our technical requirements for the engine for the new engine, 200 horsepower, minimum of 10 wheels, range of 350 miles, and road speed of 50 miles per hour. And then based on this CER, it will calculate what the resulting new engine weight should be, it'll estimate it to be about 2,008 pounds. So I can create a finding based on this, which I've already done. When I go back to findings, you can see that I have a finding now for my engine weight of 2,008 pounds. I can do a similar thing for manufacturing complexity. In this particular case, I've used a, a, a similar multivariate cost estimating relationship to estimate the calculated manufacturing complexity. Um, and I'll just briefly say that you can see over here in the right pane the statistics for goodness of fit uh, for the CER that's created by true findings. And you can also do a more simple uh, univariate uh, CERs as well as multivariate CERs. Uh, of various different types, not just linear, but exponential, polynomial, uh, a, lot of, a lot of statistical analysis capability in true findings. But for this particular use case, what I've done is use the same multivariate linear CER uh, to look at calculated manufacturing complexity as a result of horsepower, number of drive wheels, range, and road speed. The same four input variables that I used before. I go over here, here's my resulting CER. I input those same requirements over here. And in this case, I, re I come up with the resulted manufacturing uh, complexity value of 2.861 for our new engine, uh, which if I go back here, you'll see right here. Now, before I leave true findings, um, I want to do a search. Uh, on the existing database to see if there are any existing COT engines uh, that might meet our requirements and possibly save us money. So how can I easily do that in true findings? Well, I have 15 engines right now, which aren't too many, so I could actually study the data. But imagine you had a much larger database. It would take you a long time to study that. So I can easily put filters on the data over here in the lower left and I'll just briefly demonstrate to you how that works. So we know that our minimum drum or our drive wheels is 10 in this particular case, so I can put a minimum limit of 10 drive wheels on here. Uh, that didn't filter out very many. Um, but we also know that we have a road speed requirement of a minimum of 50 miles per hour. So we can put that requirement in here. And we can see right away that those two requirements alone have filtered down the COTS engine database to a total of three different engine options that meet those requirements. So what we'll do here is we'll just take those, we'll, we'll, we'll say that those three engines are viable alternatives and we'll create findings for those three COTS engines here, which I've already done down here at the bottom. Uh, I've basically created findings for engine weight, manufacturing complexity, as well as the normalized unit cost for each of those three COTS engines. So with this done, now I can go back to true planning and use these findings to estimate the total costs of these options in the vehicle. So let me close out of this. Let me go to true planning. Um, since this is an engine trade, we're going to go to the power package, drivetrain, WBS in mill standard 881. 
uh, and we're going to look at the engine option supplier assessment. All right, so uh, let me include these so that we can look at the results. Okay. So in order to clearly see the results of these options, I can do a uh, graph or chart to show those results again. And I can um, pick a, a graph that I've already done here for make versus buy, which shows you uh, a quick comparison of the unit production cost for the four different engine options, A, B, C, D. And you can quickly see that engine option B and engine option C uh, provide the lowest unit production costs. I can further see by hovering over those columns that the actual unit production cost for engine C is $3,071, uh, and the unit production cost for engine B is $2,907. So engine option B, supplier A, is clearly uh, the lowest cost, best value engine selection that meets all of our requirements. So let me briefly move into the uh, 5B use case. So as a continuation of what we just did, um, We've noted that the engine supplier uh, who's supplying the engine that we just selected um, has, has bid that or, or we've been uh, using a 15% fee uh, on that engine. So through a BAFO, best and final negotiation, uh, we were actually able to negotiate the supplier's fee down to 12%. So let me show you how easy it is in true planning to perform that trade. Um, so if I go to this one, uh, basically what I've done here is I just took a copy of our end result here, engine option B, supplier A, and I copied it down here. So this is the exact same result um, as we had up here. Uh, but then I've built a version of it to show what the difference is for a 12% fee. And how do I do that? What I do is I use a custom worksheet set in True Planning. So you'll notice that for engine supplier A, I have a custom worksheet set. I can easily click on that uh, and go to a resource here. Uh, let's just pick uh, production manufacturing. Uh, material, and you can see that the baseline cost assumed a 15% fee here. So what I do is I create a new, a copy of that worksheet set and modify it for the BAFO negotiation. Um, and similarly, I can click on that worksheet set and look at the same input, production manufacturing material. Uh, and you can see that I've changed the fee assumption now to 12%. So uh, we can um, see the difference of this by looking at a, another chart. Um, here it is right here. Uh, so you can see that we've uh, achieved uh, an additional unit production cost savings. Uh, through a BAFO negotiation with that supplier, resulting in a total unit production cost for the engine of $2,831. Okay, so uh, that concludes the use cases. Uh, let me just say, uh, before I turn this back over to Megan for Q&A, that obviously I tried to show you five different use cases here in an hour. And um, that's obviously quite a bit to do in an hour. So I'm sure that many of you have many thoughts uh, or additional questions that you'd like to ask. Clearly, if you have some easy ones, we'd love to answer those for you now. But more importantly, um, if you'd like to pursue any of this further or understand it better, we would encourage you 
uh, to reach out to me um, at my contact information, which I'll put back up here on the screen. Chris Price at PriceSystems.com uh, at this direct phone. Uh, or, uh, even better yet, if you're going to be at the ICEA workshop next month uh, in Portland, stop by and see us at the booth. We'll be easy to spot. We're a gold sponsor for ICEA. Uh, and one of the folks there would be more than happy to explore any of this in more detail with you. So I think we're going to open it up for questions now with the few minutes we have left. Uh, Megan, can you uh, help me orchestrate that? I sure can. What I'm going to do, uh, we got a question from Patricia Young. Let me find her name here. I can unmute, so get ready, Patricia, clear your throat. Patricia? Yes, I'm here. Okay, go ahead. Um, hi, Chris, it's Patty. Um, I was just I looking at that voice. <laughs> I I was looking at I was watching your supplier assessment for the make buy, and I was expecting to see um, I was expecting to see the cost object, which I did see in your PBS at the end, but I was noticing in the data that you had put in the um, two findings tool. It said hardware component for all of that engine data, and I was just a little confused. Oh, okay. No, that's a that's a good question, uh, Patty. And and it's really, it's really just a what I call a misnomer in that um, for those COTS engines um, that are in that database, uh, we actually use the hardware component to model uh, the manufacturing complexity for structure. Uh, for those you you oh. can't really do that using the cots object so we we use the hardware cost object originally and and really the only reason that says hardware in there is so that it in this case it's pretty obvious but we want to differentiate obviously between hardware and software and and that's really the only reason that's in there so okay thank you thank you because yeah when you got to the other part I was like oh that's that's what I thought you would do but it said hardware component in the data, and I was confused. Okay, thank you. Hopefully that clarifies it. And, of course, you know how to contact me if you'd like to explore it further. Absolutely. All right. Megan? Right, thanks, Patty. I'm going to mute you back now. Uh, then we got a whole mess of questions from Alan Lynch, who uh, will probably be reaching out to you, Chris. Um, All right. Very good. Look forward to it, Alan. The... the uh, Alan's not able to have a mic right now, so I'm going to ask one of them that I'm pretty sure I will be able to ask without messing up the jargon. Um, he wants to know if companies can use their own parameters that they've created, homegrown parameters, and input them into true planning. Okay, absolutely. An excellent question. So there's actually about three different ways that you can do that. I kind of demonstrated one to you today uh, where I showed you true findings and how you can generate CERs in true findings uh, to actually use in true planning. Um, so I'm sure you, you kind of followed that. Now, the way in which you'd use those CERs or other CERs that you've derived from other places is there are two different options um, available to you. Um, we have in true planning what we call a generic equation cost object type. And this is basically a free form CER cost object that allows you to actually plug your custom CER uh, into an equation cost object and use that uh, in true planning in one or more places. Uh, and you can have any number of different equation cost objects representing different CERs you can rename them so that it's clear what it is you're estimating uh, and provide inputs for each of those. So that's probably the easiest way to use custom CERs in True Planning. Uh, we also have a capability called True Analyst um, that is what our cost research department uses to develop uh, cost objects. Um, and we can discuss with you if you have more sophisticated models uh, which would be a result of more than one cost estimating relationship, we can talk to you about how best to actually integrate 
custom cost objects into true planning. So I think I'll leave it at that today, Alan, and be glad to discuss that with you in more detail later. Megan? Yeah, okay, well thank you very much. Um, that was all the questions that I got through the question text box, um, but again, as Chris said, if okay. anyone has questions that they'd like to discuss privately, please reach out to Chris. Um, he'll also, you'll be at the conference in Portland, yes? Uh, that's uh, two to be determined still, but certainly oh, there will okay. be many folks of my caliber there if I'm not there, so any one of us oh, can, most certainly. Uh, can certainly talk to these folks about uh, price cost analytics. Yes, there's always a whole bunch of price folks at the conference. Um, they're big supporters of ICEA, and um, we are always very grateful. So I would like to thank everyone for paying attention today. Uh, I hope to see as many of you as I can in Portland in a couple of weeks. Um, and thanks to Chris for a, a great lunch hour and informative uh, understanding of true planning. Chris, do you want to? Happy to do it. Yeah, happy okay. to do it, Megan. All right. Well, thanks very much, everyone, and uh, we'll call it lunch. Have a good afternoon. Okay.